I saw a mock trade proposal so bad the other day that I almost passed out. And I was going to leave it alone, but for other reasons I've decided not to. So now I am going to politely dismantle this idea. So I was at work the other day. I was taking a break, and I was scrolling through Reddit, and I see this screenshot that I'm about to put up here, and I'll give you a moment to read that. But essentially, when I saw the screenshot, I kind of already knew who wrote it immediately without even seeing his name. And I'll just be straight with you guys. I don't care for Greg Wazinski. I never have. I didn't like him when he was one of, like, three people pretending to care about a hockey at ESPN before they got the broadcasting rights back, and now there's, like five people over at ESPN who actually kind of sort of pretend to care about hockey, so I guess that's a step in the right direction. Here's my thing about this. If you want to make mock trade proposals, no matter how egregious others might see that they are, I'm okay with that. But I'm not okay with you pretending that you're a victim because you get criticized frequently because you get paid to make bad editorial choices and this is one of them. Now I'm actually re-recording the part that I'm on right now because earlier the sun was still out and it was coming through the window and it was way too bright and it just kind of didn't look good. So I will say this before you see the rest of the video. I do not know how well this is going to turn out. This is my first time referencing a bunch of advanced stats. But I think that most hockey fans, even ones that are a little bit more casual, if I said, hey, I have Nick Jensen, would you give me Brett Pesci? I think that they would say no, even if Brett Pesci is the main piece in a larger deal. So essentially what I'm getting at here is making mock trades are fine. Coming up with this stuff is fine. It's all completely inconsequential. But when you get paid to come up with these things, you should put a little bit of effort into it like I am going to show you that I did in this video. I might not exactly nail how I'm going to present my argument, but I'm going to try my best. I will take any criticism. I will answer any questions. But just looking at this trade off the get-go makes zero sense. First off, these teams are in the same division, and especially in this day and age, you don't trade in the same division. The team in the Metropolitan Division that the Hurricanes, or actually any of them except for the one I'm about to mention, should consider trading with is the Flyers because they're in rebuild mode. Seven of the eight teams in the Metropolitan Division are totally capable of making the playoffs, and it wouldn't be the first time that five of the eight playoff seeds have been Metropolitan Division teams. So Columbus didn't make the playoffs last season. I think they make it this season. You know, they had they had a bunch of injuries. Like, I remember I was at the home opener when the Hurricanes played against them, and Patrick Laine broke his wrist or something like that because I saw him go on the boards, and it just kind of, you know, went a little funny on him. Bovey's dad, unfortunately, passed away, and he was gone for two weeks, and Washington had a ton of injury problems. They could have, like, had a playoff spot had they not been hit with, you know, that many unfortunate circumstances. The Penguins blew it. They were They had to win one game, and they were in wild card two, and they blew it, and that's how Florida got in. The Islanders are still a really tough, scrappy team, and I can see them getting into wild card one or maybe even finishing third. Even if the Rangers fell from cup contender to having to retool a little bit, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't make the playoffs. They're going to have a couple of cap casualties, but I don't see any reason why they won't place third or be in wild card one at least. New Jersey will more than likely finish either first or second in the division, if not win the President's Trophy, so they'll be a postseason threat. And the Hurricanes, of course, I think will make the playoffs again and probably win the division again. If they don't, they'd finish second, I think. And, you know, it's just they're in the hardest division in the game. The last thing you'd want to do is take the chance of, you know, if a trade really doesn't work out, you make another team in the same division better and make yours worse at the same time, and you lose a bunch of four-point swings that might make your path to the end even harder than it's already going to be because the Hurricanes are already going to have a hard one by default just being in this division. Not to mention, there's just a ton of other little things in this that make it not make sense. So let's go into his reasoning here before we start comparing the players. So the Hurricanes receive Evgeny Kuznetsov with 25% salary retention and Nick Jensen. Oh boy, this is already bad. In exchange for... Brett Pesci, Tavo Teravainen, and a 2024 second round pick. Okay. 
Jesus Christ. I cannot believe that somebody actually wrote this. Wow, if this... If AI wrote this, every scenario that anyone was worried about based on Terminator or Battlestar Galactica, I don't think we have to worry about that, at least for a while. Oh my god, okay. Let's see the rest of the rationale for this. Alright, so Kuznetsov has two years remaining on his contract. He's 31 years old, so he would be 33 when it expires. And he's making 7.8 million AAV right now. Okay, we knew that already. Okay, so I actually had to go look up the rest of the article. I'm going to pull it up and make sure that I read it right. Because I was just going to screenshot the rest of it and put it up here. It turns out it's a subscription-only article. If you have ESPN+, Plus, you can read it. Which, that's a crime in of itself. If it becomes clear their financial assets aren't aligned, I could see the Hurricanes trading him now. That's no secret way to piggyback on what other people have said. Um, but, he, okay, th this, is where, this is where this goes really sideways. That's where Jensen comes in. A great defender signed at $4.050 million annually for the next three seasons. Looked at Nick Jensen's numbers, and I'm not saying that he's a bad defender, but on the Hurricanes... He would not even crack the bottom pair, I don't think. Not, He's definitely not going to fit into the way Carolina has their salary structured, has the salary cap structured, making just under $4 million. Teravine helps make the money work. He makes $5.4 million against the cap and his UFA next summer and fills some of the capital's offensive need. Okay, if he fills some of the offensive need, why trade Kuznetsov? Like, it, it, once I compare them, it's really going to make even less sense, but you're saying, hey, the Hurricanes need a dynamic offensive center. Let's trade away a winger, and the Caps get a winger back. Who are the Caps going to put at 2C? You just traded Lars Eller. Like, this makes no sense. Washington retains 25% to move Kuznetsov's contract, earns a second rounder, and gets a, gets a chance to ink Pesci long term. So, I don't think Pesci goes anywhere without a sign and trade if he does get traded at all. Um... Long-term as a younger upgrade of Jensen. Two division rivals going back to the Southeast days, helping each other out. Okay. This doesn't help either team at all. All right, let me, let me put this article away before my nose starts bleeding on camera. This does not help either team at all. The surface alone, com trading Tara Vinen and Kuznetsov is not beneficial to either one of them. Kuznetsov is definitely a great playmaking center, but he's made a lot of points from helping Alex Ovechkin score goals. Kind of like what I was talking about the other day with Zach Hyman. Zach Hyman is a good hockey player, but he's got numbers a lot higher than he would probably ever have because he was playing with Connor McDavid. And that's not necessarily of detriment to him. Yes, a pulley Arby played with Connor McDavid, and he, unfortunately, his career didn't materialize in Edmonton. And we know in Carolina he's had a hard time. Pesci for Jensen... This is hardly worth discussing. Okay, so even if you lose Pesci and Shea both, you got a better defenseman that you're paying in league minimum right now with Jalen Chatfield. Nick Jensen probably doesn't even make the bottom pair in Carolina. Just in regards to Kuznetsov and Turbo here, we're going to look at those numbers first. So after we compare four of the five pieces that would be in this theoretical monstrosity, I mean trade, we'll talk about the money. And we'll also talk about the pick in addition to the four pieces because that's just a big net loss for Carolina and there's not much really else to say about it. Okay, so we'll compare the money last. What we're going to compare now is Terabyte and Kuznetsov. And then after that, we're going to compare Jensen and Pesci. And in addition to them, we're going to compare Chatfield to them. And I have a good reason as to why. And I'll probably say it again at the end with just a little extra emphasis to go with everything else that I'm about to say. But the second rounder in 2024 coming from Carolina going to Washington makes this a total complete loss for Carolina, even more so than it already is. So first off, if Washington does retain 25% salary and Teravine and maintains his current contract, then the difference would be $450,000. Carolina would still be taking on a bigger cap hit for 75% of Kuznetsov's contract versus Teravine and current contract. Alright, so taking a look at some of their basic stats here. This is before we get into the advanced stuff. I've got it pulled up right here where I can see it. So, Kuznetsov is two years older. Not a big deal, but you got to keep that in mind. He is on the wrong side of 30. 30. Turbo's getting close, but he's not there yet. Um, they've both been playing the same amount of seasons from the 2013-2014 season. They're both currently active, obviously. Kuznetsov has an edge in games played, 680 to 594. Goals... 
35, that's not a huge difference, but a little bit of an edge to Kuznetsov there. But he spent his entire career on an offense, uh, an offensive powerhouse of a team. Assists, like I already stated, in the playmaking department, Kuznetsov has a undeniable edge. But Carolina needs goal scorers. They got plenty of distributors. Aho, Natchez, and even to a greater degree than I imagined that he would be Svechnikov. And then not to mention all the playmaking ability that you have from the blue line with guys like Burnsy and Shea. Sorry, I'm having to pet my dog. He's getting anxiety from hearing me even talk about this. Um, even strength, Kuznetsov has a definitive goals edge. Power play goals, they're not that close either, 118 to 96. Teravainen has, uh, wow. Teravainen has 10 shorthanded assists. That's pretty good. Um, shots on goal, Kuznetsov has a definitive advantage there. Shooting percentage, terrifying is only 1.2 behind him in that, and it, it frustrates me. That's one thing that does frustrate with me, me with Tara Vinen is how little he shoots the puck because he's got a great shot. He's way more capable of shooting it than what he does. Um, let's see. Average time on ice. Uh, Tara Vinen's probably going to be employed in less situations in Washington than he would be in Carolina. I don't know how they'd utilize him as far as on the penalty kill and everything like that, but the thing that doesn't make sense to me here, Wojcicki says that Washington needs offense, but the way I'm looking at it here, Teravainen's the better pick offensive, or I'm um, excuse me, Kuznetsov is the better pick offensively in the grand scheme of things. So, so everyone knows the Hurricanes need goal scorers and size, but more than anything, goal scorers. Yet, yeah, Teravainen and Kuznetsov had the same amount of goals in 2023, and Teravainen played way less games. Kuznetsov played 81, whereas Teravainen only played 68. I don't see how this helps either team. So, Washington's already lost a little bit of center depth from where they traded Lars Eller, and Carolina needs scoring, but they're not going to get it from Kuznetsov. They don't need any more distributors. They've got plenty of those between, you know, KK and... Aho and Natchez, you need somebody whose job in life is to put a puck in the net, and that's not Kuznetsov. All right, so taking a look at these on the surface, you might think that the one on my left, your right, if you're watching this, if you're just listening to this on audio, I'll try to paint a bit of a picture for you. These players are almost identical in the aspect of expected goals and the heat map of which they're shooting. And looking at this, and this is from the season that just concluded, the regular season that just concluded, Teravainen and Kuznetsov are almost identical in that regard. So if you take on 75% of Kuznetsov's contract, you're basically paying an extra $450,000 for not much of a difference. And, you know, at, at a glance, Teravainen looks significantly better defensively, and he's an asset shorthanded. This, you, you might get a little bit more power play percentages and better playmaking out of Kuznetsov, but the Hurricanes don't need any more playmakers. They need a sniper. And th this trade already doesn't make any sense, and this is even before I'm getting to the most egregious part of it. So comparing forwards and saying, hey, we need scoring, hey, we need scoring, hey, we need playmaking, hey, we need this, hey, we need that, it's actually kind of simple compared to saying comparing defensive metrics between... Yeah, Come here, buddy. My dog, he's getting all crazy. C comparing the defensive metrics that I'm about to compare between Nick Jensen and Brett Pesci, but this this doesn't seem like... The only way I could see that this part of the trade working, let's say that this was a one-for-one -one trade, Kuznetsov for Tara Vinen, if it was something along the lines of when the Hurricanes traded Victor Rast to Minnesota to get Nino Niederreiter, and it basically came down to... Because there were a bunch of pieces in that trade initially, Waddell said. So it was basically like, I have a player that needs a fresh start, you have a player that needs a fresh start. Let's trade them and see who it works out for, and ultimately it worked out better for Carolina. So if it were a situation like that, I could maybe see this particular aspect of it, but nobody really wins here, I don't think. Carolina nor Washington wins here. I just I just don't see that. This just this is already bad. This is this was the only part of the trade that might have ended up being any way sensible. And I have looked at this from about a million different angles, and I cannot find a way that it's sensible at all. Now we're going to go to the next part here, and we are going to look at the comparison between Brett Pesci and Nick Jensen. I don't mean to offend 
any professional athlete when I say this, but comparing Brett Pesci and Nick Jensen, who are both there on merit, they're both very good hockey players, is like comparing apples to rotten apples. I'm sorry. Like, I'm trying to find a way that this is remotely justifiable, even factoring in the Teravainen and Kuznetsov aspect of it, and it makes even less sense to me now than it did before. Okay, so first off, Nick Jensen is making a little bit more money than Brett Pesci. Now, Pesci is due for a raise, and when I factor in the money at the end of this, I'm basically using the same contract that Damon Severson got because he's the one who kind of set the market. So this particular stuff I'm showing right here is nothing that I'm going to use to make any specific argument, but this is just to show that Brett Pesci had a pretty stable season in regards to who he was paired with. He was pretty much always with Brady Shea. So he had that going for him. He had really good chemistry with him. He never had to bounce around. Excuse me. Honorable mention to Jacob Slavin and Brent Burns. And those pairs are ranked third and fourth respectively. Pesci and Shea being the third pair overall in the league over the whole season. So I want to make a fair comparison here. Nick Jensen was on here. Let me count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten different pairings. So, two of them I don't think you should bother factoring in. Because one of them has a time of ice... Or, excuse me. One of them has a time on ice of 54 seconds where he was with Dylan McIlrath. And then Lucas Johansson he was with for a grand total of six seconds. So, we can just throw those out. That's not even a real sample size. So, I want to give credit where it's due. Pesci is on a much better team as far as defense goes. And he had a stable defensive partner pretty much all season so i just want to make sure that that is understood that i am not just arbitrarily saying that pesci is the better defenseman because he was on a better defensive team this was actually a very simple one that i pulled from the fox sports website so this is basically the ratio of takeaways and giveaways actually that's exactly what it is on my left is nick jensen and on my right is brett pesci nick jensen has never even broken let's see his highest takeaway giveaway ratio was 0.67 and that was only with six takeaways and nine giveaways so that's not really a huge sample size whereas if you look over on the right side here with Pesci his lowest has been 0.81 and that was during the shortened season and then this season he was 2.31 that's pretty remarkable but he's never other than that one season with the small sample size that I just mentioned where he was 0.81 he's never been less than 1.08 so comparing some of their adjusted stats over the course of their entire careers, and they've been playing about the same amount of time. Pesci's got one season on him. Goals created, Pesci has a definitive edge, 59.8 to 37.6. Uh, 0, 0 0.02 edge in the goals department. He's got an edge in the assist department, 0 0.27 to 2.1. 0 0.33 to 0 0.25. Goals created, he's ahead 0 0.11 to 0 0.08. Adjusted totals, he's got 39 to 19 with goals, 136 to 109 with assists, 202 to 128 with the points. So he's even winning like in the offensive categories here, and that's not Brett Pesci's primary strength. It's not what you bring him on for. He's definitely got a little bit of an offensive game, but goals created 65.7 total goals. Or, or actually, hold up, here's what I really want to look at: OPS and DPS. Okay, so defensive point shares, which are basically the points created because of a player's defense. He has a big edge there, 34.4. Th this is not even close. I'm sorry. I, I tried to make it close even. I, I was trying to find a way to maybe say, yeah, trading Nick Jensen for Brett Pesci in some way or another could work out with extra pieces. No. This would be a net loss all the way across to the Hurricanes. No. And it would ultimately be a net loss to the Capitals, too, if they don't have an extension in place when they trade him. Or they would pay him more than what Severson is getting paid. And he's worth a lot, but I personally, I don't think you can pay him more than what Damon Severson is making. Which sucks, because I think overall, Brett Pesci is a better defenseman than Damon Severson, but Damon Severson is a puck mover. He scores, and the ability at scoring comes at a premium. So, that's why he's making the amount of money he's making. Alright guys, so I've decided to split this one up into two parts. Um, I spent a lot more time on it than I thought that I would. Um, and even then, I'm not really particularly satisfied yet, particularly with the argument that I'm making in regards to Pesci and Jensen, even though I kind of feel like that's pretty pretty cut and dry. 
So I would like to do a part two to this, and then I'm going to factor in Chatfield and factor in the pick and everything like that. I don't know when that's going to be. I really want to finish my draft video. But that's all I've got for tonight. Y'all take care, and I will see you next time. Do all the YouTube stuff, too, the liking and the commenting and the subscribing and all that.